Welcome again to another episode of Unconditioned Mind podcast, which um, is a project of Awakened Global. I'm really excited about uh, starting this podcast because we want to get the conversation out there and start debating this issue. So today's subject is on gender inequality, and I'm really excited uh, about my guest today, Dr. Kuzai Fanyoro who is a specialist on inequality. So uh, we're going to have a real great conversation. And maybe we can start by you just introducing yourself, telling our audience, you know, yeah. what you do, uh, just a little background and so on. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Mam Nunko, and thank you for having me. Um, I, I like when you when you say that um, a specialist in inequality, which, <laughs> which basically is always like um, a very, it's a very a lifelong project and, um, the hope is that one can master everything at the end. But yeah, before we get there, I mean, by way of introduction, I am a 32-year-old man. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. Um, so I'm, I am a foreign national in South Africa, and I am married to an amazing woman from Zimbabwe as well. Um, my family is from Mashingo. That's where um, my um, grandfather, who was a community leader, they um, raised his family so it's a rural space, and that's where my father um, was born and raised. An interesting story about uh, my identity, which I think will also be important for our conversation around difference and diversity and um, the question of inequality, is that at the time my grandfather came to South Africa um, in the Limpopo region where he met, he met my grandmother, who is a Tsonga woman, and... Um, uh, for lack of a better term, imported her to Zim, uh, and uh, that's where they started their family. Um, I also then also have a, a twin brother, so I'm, I'm the, we're both the first in a family of five. Um, we also um, he's also a vet and and he's also an academic. In terms of my education life, everything happened in Zimbabwe. That's where I did my primary and secondary education. Um, and um, fast forward. Uh, to honors, um, I did my honors in media and society at the Midland State University is uh, in um, in Gweru, which is a small uh, town that we consider to be a city in the context of Zimbabwe. Um, and then I completed that. Then in 2018, I moved to South Africa fully to start my MA and also my PhD in critical diversity studies at the Witt Center for Diversity Studies. Um, I think that that would be all around my background in terms of what I've researched and studied. Um, most of my work focuses on critical diversity literacy. So the, the question of l looking at inequality and how we can map um, various points of our identity and how they shape experiences of inequality across various spaces. So I think in a nutshell, mom, that's, that's a background of, of myself. I actually would like to hear more around inequality as an expert in the area. I mean, you've done a lot of research because I don't even think we understand what inequality is. Maybe we should start our conversation there. Certainly, certainly. Um, yeah, like I did mention at the beginning that inequality, the question of inequality is really a lifelong project, particularly when one thinks about the, how, how we're implicated in relationships of inequality because we, we don't live or exist um, in a cocoon where we're enclosed from, from the social, political, and economic dynamics around us. So I would say, like any one of us um, probably would say, that I have experienced inequality firsthand. And I think th that uh, being a Zimbabwean who lived, who obviously has lived in a country where inequality is so rife, um, and I really know what it feels like to experience other people having more than others, um, sort of from a basic understanding of lived experiences of inequality. But also moving to South Africa, which is considered to be one of the most unequal um, societies in, in the world, um, you find that inequality is a state of affairs. It's a, it's a daily experience. Uh, for example, people living in Sentin, um, are right next door to, to Alex, where inequality um, and, and poverty are, are really sort of overwhelming. So by definition, um, I would describe inequality as the, the, the disparity or the difference in opportunities, resources, and capacitation among people, um, and, and also the distribution of these resources. Um, and 
when it comes to the actual idea around discourses of inequality, I think it is shaped by the uh, the social constructions that paint other people as more important than others. So then, how do we get to a point when other people begin to other lives begin to matter more than others? Um, at Wicked's, we talk about at Wicked's is, is the Fit Center for Diversity Studies. We talk about um, cert- the construction of certain differences that make a difference. So the fact that someone, for example, wears a different shoe size from someone else, at what point does that then determine what resources that other person has to have access to? So, uh, and, 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 and finally, one of my favorite texts on inequality is George Orwell's Animal Farm, um, which, which basically ex- explains the, the, the story of ownership of a farm by human beings and the animals seeing that the, the, the sweat of their labor was resulting in the humans living better than them. And then they draft a plan and there's a revolution. Um, long story short, um, it, when they chase out the humans, the new forms of inequality emerge where the pigs have more advantage to, uh, I mean, um, in comparison to the other animals on the farm. So then using that example, um, I think I, I really want to... To, to, to consider inequality as something that haunts humanity, that where they, where they are humans, where they are living species, there's always going to be sort of a desire to be better than the other. And it is a lifelong project for people to consider what really causes all of that. Yeah, I mean, I've often wondered, now that I'm really interested in this subject, that who's really responsible for inequality and who should solve that problem? Because they are mm. the advantaged and disadvantaged, the privileged and, and the one that mm. are disadvantaged. Mm. So uh, the way I see this is that maybe not just around the, the human species and other species as well, there's hierarchy uh, and so on. And uh, there are those who, you know, will use others for for their apart mobility mm. and and these things may be structural and so on but when it I'm, i mean i'm a bad bird watcher so i i watch birds in my own garden and and i give them food you know mm. and it's, it's always fascinating for me the hierarchy there so there's the spiral sort of lowest <laughs> in the realm of privilege mm. let, 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 let us say and then uh, when you know another bird like a miner comes in, yes. so sort of everybody just flies away mm-hmm. because the miner has come because it's, it's the bully yes. of of uh, of the garden of the terrain at that time. Mm-hmm. And then when let's say a crow mm-hmm. comes in, then everybody flies away. Mm-hmm. So you know, so whenever I put this food, I always think about the sparrow. So I try to mechanisms to make sure that they also have they have enough and so on. So I say there's a hierarchy everywhere, but when it comes to human beings, who then is responsible for this inequality? I mean, when you look at women and black people in South Africa, for instance, which is my area of interest, yes. when we complain about the slow pace of transformation, I always wonder who are we complaining to because. Who can champion our own transformation better than than ourselves? Mm. And and I know that as experts and as academics, you're trying to solve this problem of of inequality. But can we ever not have inequality? Mm. But who can really put you there and and oppress you unless you also participate? And, and allow the situation of being oppressed. Mm, mm. Maybe you can just yeah, comment there. Certainly. I think, I think that's a very great example because you have me thinking about the, the, the issue of resources, which you mentioned when you, when you talk about the distribution of the grain to the birds, right? Like, mm. I think one of the central things would be the question of resources. And we, we speak about, I mean, when we talk about human rights, we, we talk about the sort of what are defined as basic human rights that everyone should, without necessarily having to fast or protest or go into the uh, road with a placard, uh, should just wake up and be entitled to. And the question is, I mean, to go back to the example of the animal farm, who wakes up in the morning, which bodies wake up in the morning 
with rights, right? And and like organically, that from the day that this particular person is born, they are entitled to certain rights that others are not. And f- from a historic perspective, we can go back to the legacy of colonialism, which basically what it did was to say that white bodies um, have a right to wake up in the morning, not necessarily wake up, but that's another level, but to be born white meant to be born with a kind of um, a certificate to certain resources or a license to certain resources. And um, some acad- academics have spoken about what is termed, I mean, I mean, we talk about the social contract, the the contract that exists between the state and its uh, citizens, but then that contract is not afforded equally, um, so other bodies matter more than others. Um, so then I think that's a, a very important example because it makes us think about resources that some animals are equal, but some are more equal than others on this farm. So then when it comes to gender, um, being a man also um, affords you access to education. Um, the day that you are born in a family that is under-resourced, already it is determined that it would rather send the boy child to school and then um, the girl child can come as a form of sort of, if we find extra. So then they kind of, the girl child, particularly in impoverished African communities, then go to school sporadically and then they're t- trained to be married, etc. cetera. Um, we at the center talk about um, the question of inequality. The, the current crisis is more, than w- um, is more than what people want to paint it out to be, that it's a high-level argumentation for people uh, wanting luxurious rights. Like people want access to water, you know, uh, people want access to, to jobs, people want access to what is considered basic. So in terms of that, then I think it's these people that, um, for example, myself as a man, um, I am part of the system that uh, perpetuates hierarchies that are gendered, a way if I'm born and I'm given certain resources, how do I say no to it? Or how do I say, well, can you give this to, um, to, the, girl, to, to the girl or the woman next to me? Uh, did white people ever say no to the privilege that came with apartheid? Uh, so then the system continues to, to, to perpetuate. The same story with being born as part of being um, born, if that's a term for birds, as part of these birds that are on top of the food chain. Uh, they will continue with the, the hierarchy. I mean, for things to change, then there has to be a certain uh, sensibility of sharing and, and, and community, and, and that's something that it, it proves to be really hard to, to, to come by. Hence, the work that people are doing around uh, and William, when he comes to talk about the philosophy of liberation, and uh, there have been many political ideas around socialism, which, communism, which have also been abused to, to really perpetuate inequality. So, yeah, it's, it's really a difficult one. So, yeah, I suppose, I mean, when you look right through history, uh, it continues until those who are disadvantaged get tired of it. And, and mm. then, you know, a struggle for liberation starts mm. and then we go through you know some form of liberation but even that settles back to another form mm. Mm. Of, of of inequality and and it's said for me that for for women you know there's always been you know the the free men and the slave and then the when colonialism started mm. for instance then there was racism and uh, and so on, mm. but women have always been part of the the that base that yes. is inequal in mm. every society, and 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 I think women now are coming to that place of also getting tired of carrying the burden for the rest of society when men are, are really just having a, a free ride mm. as they awaken to themselves and their abilities and their capabilities and realizing that this system has been unfair on us. Mm. So, so so let's go back to, to gender inequality. I, I'm really interested to just focus on that and, and, and if from your um, research and all of that, how do you define gender inequality specifically? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's yeah. Well, that's that's a very um, important and very difficult uh, question in terms of sort of narrowing it down. But I will obviously try my best. Uh, so, so in, in a nutshell, for me, then gender equality would be the the differences in in access, the differences 
in liberties and the differences in in, in sort of privilege um, or distribution that take place as a result of the fact that um, one is gendered as um, either male or female at birth. Um, so again, to go back to to that um, hint or or, or or phrase that we 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 like to work with, which is differences that make a difference, right? So so then these are inequalities that are birthed from the fact that someone decided that this particular uh, genetic or, or sort of bodily comp composition really means that this person is meant to do care work um, or, or that because th this person is, is, is born with a particular so-called reproductive capacity, then it means that they have access to certain privileges and spaces. And it basically meant um, uh, from, from, from a historical perspective that as far as to suggest that um, the one who is who is born and, and gendered, not born but gendered, um, to be to be to be to be male, is the thinker, right? Uh, that um, to be a woman meant uh, one does not think, one does not exercise intellectual capacities, that you are more sort of emotional than you are rational, um, and and then those conversations then feed into the wider s uh, s systems that maintain uh, through these hierarchies through. Um, uh, from the home um, to the workplace, um, and even these things ma matter in life and in death, which is very sad. That even in in in, in most of our communities, even the way that people are mourned, the way that people are, are buried, are actually determined on whether they're man or woman. So then that that construction, those inequalities that are based on how uh, your your bodily composition. Um, are haunting t um, from the point of life when it starts to when it ends, and 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 that cycle continues to 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 haunt us. Um, so, from a structural perspective, like broadly, it then it then determines who has access to economic opportunities, who's going to get this this particular uh, job. Um, even if you do get that job, um, what kind of voice or say do you have in the space? Um, so much that it has also been internalized by the oppressed uh, that women, so you have some women that actually f think that men are better than them, um, which speaks to the efficiency um, of the system that it is so much so much managed to convince the oppressed that this is where you belong. Um, and to link that to, for example, from a racial standpoint, when, when Biko was doing his work and Fanon, that they observed this internalization of racial stereotypes by black people that you look in the mirror and you tend to, to start to believe it. And that's where, where it even gets more difficult to deal with. Yeah, that, that's so sad. Because when I look at how society has defined these two roles of men and, mm -hmm. and women, and, and because uh, women were defined as the caregivers, they were not offered the same opportunities in terms of development, you know, uh, in terms of acquiring skills outside the home and all of that. And for me, these are just skills. Uh, home care and domestic responsibilities are just skills. And, and if we look at you know, business and, and other organizations, they're just skills. And, and women are now proving to be just as, as powerful and as smart mm -hmm. as men now that they, are, they have more opportunities in business. And and men have not most men, let me put it this way, have not even seen the need to develop their domestic skills. Mm -hmm. They still believe that it is the woman's job to do those the, the work, in spite of the fact that the woman is also working, is also yeah. providing, mm -hmm. and all of that. You know, when you talk about internalization. When I was married, for instance, I was very tough at work and never allowed myself to be oppressed or defined, yeah. to be inferior or weak or, or anything like that. And I succeeded. But when it came to home, I was socialized by my tradition to believe uh, that I have a responsibility to be a traditional wife. And I carried that burden. Mm. I was the breadwinner uh, in terms of providing for the for the family. I was the one who was really providing more than my my husband then. Mm. And but I I believed 
that it was my responsibility to carry that burden. I remember, for instance, during uh, times of holidays, yeah. I had this big job of being the chief financial officer of a big corporation and at home, a traditional wife. When the helper is not there over holidays, yeah. let's say, then I became everything. I was the, you know, looking after kids, cleaning the house, cooking, mm. while my ex-husband was lying on the couch or going out with friends, mm. until I was just literally exhausted. And I never even thought of having a conversation with him to say, you still look up to me yeah. as the provider mm. of the home. You know, I provide not just for the kids, I provide for you as well. Mm. Uh, although he, he also had a professional job, and uh, but the, 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 there's no equity at home in terms of how we share responsibility because I was so socialized yeah. to believe that this was my, my responsibility. So when you look at how we still, although there's been progress around gender inequality both at home and, and, and in the workplace, um what what is slowing the progress are these beliefs that have been socialized these myths mm. about the, the the woman being inferior and, and and weak and all of that so in your view what needs to be done to to deal with this gender inequality um to move the needle you know, mm -hmm. because I think you can sense a frustration yeah. now in the system when before there's an explosion, you know, because we don't need another revolution. Before there's an explosion... Yeah, maybe we do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think we need to do to just yeah. begin to really make an impact around gender inequality? Mm. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Mam Nonko, even for sharing uh, your experiences. Um, and one thing I, I I want to uh, to say and, and that I do in my work is to acknowledge my positionality that to speak and to do this kind of work is very difficult for particularly for a masculine presenting men and like being part of the problem and I there's an an article that I I I, I did with the Daily Maverick around like our, our brothers need to we need to come to the table and sit and admit that we are part of the problem. I think the confession is always the first act towards some form of uh, conversation. And then from a religious point of view, that's why there's always that emphasis on if you confess, then you know uh, God can do something with, with who you are. So it's, it's very much uh, it's really, uh, sort of missionary and very, uh, missionary work in terms of the, the way that it's repetitive and the way that not everyone will get the message at the same time. But to, to come back to, to your example, I was thinking when you were speaking to say the reason why these things, uh, men do not want these things to change is let's think about the slave because it actually does sound like you're describing slavery, right? That uh, it is in this instance some form of modern day slavery. Um, and when, when the relationship between the slave and the slave master, the slave master would not have wanted things to change because they were benefiting and we and we go back to that word that that we were using the resources that and the outputs of the labor that comes from the woman's vulnerability and domination is one that the slave master will enjoy um, and one that they cannot critique because um, to sound very crude but to also sound very practical would that person who likes to sit on the couch and get everything down done for them and still claim a position of power want to change that. Um, and, and that's why there's a, there's a very important quote by Biko around that uh, the, op the oppressor would never sort of want to surrender the goods to the oppressed because it works for them. So, so then one of the challenges that comes with, uh, with what, what, what we are currently facing, this challenge of, of gender-based um, violence as well and um, gender inequality is this seems, in as much as I am very much optimistic in terms of what has already been done, uh, some of the affirmative work that is being carried out. The challenge with neoliberal and capitalist um, systems and environments, particularly when they are, they are carried out in a gendered fashion, is they tend to sort of give tokens and the impression that we are doing something. Um, and, and, and 
I mean, it's the same thing when we talk about colonialism more changing from that into sort of coloniality, which is what well, we have left, you know, we've learned, it's fine, our women are now happy, but still um, continue with that, with that mode of oppression. Um, I was thinking of an example when I was coming here of the, the rise in television shows, for example, uh, the real housewives of, right, like these happy housewives that are taking, uh, that are being sort of taken care of. I mean, of course, the husbands are not brought into view, and not to suggest that these women don't work for 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 the life that they live, but then that this idea that being a housewife carries some form of happiness, or that uh, uh, if you go to a Pentecostal church today, they'll t they'll tell all the women and the girls that one day you're going to be married and be happy, and you're going to have a nice white wedding, which is basically well, I have nothing against uh, weddings and marriage. I am um, uh, married myself, but the, the idea there is that that these things are being framed as commodities that, oh, look look at that happy family. Uh, but who's carrying the weight? Who's carrying the labor? And the capitalist system broadly, uh, Mam Nongku, would actually, actually enjoys the fact that all of these families uh, that are feeding into production and, and resources of the country, so the nation state becomes implicated, that they're being taken care of not necessarily being taken care of, but the first stage is the reproductive labor is the woman who's giving birth to this workforce. And then you take care of that family, you feed, you feed them, make sure that Abu uh, Kudzai come to interviews looking a little bit nice like this, um, which basically keeps the whole, um, the whole machine rolling. Um, so to, to sort of arrive to, to a conclusion to that question is, I think that the challenge lies in the obfuscation that now takes place where these gendered hierarchies are no longer uh, mentioning or calling themselves um, violence, that we think, oh, this is actually um, a happy situation, there's consent, you know, look, 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 at, look at what is happening between them, they're so in love. But the story that you just shared is a story of your actual experiences. So in, in short, I think we need more spaces that Acknowledge these experiences and the conscientization of the of the, um, the the male mind, like the mind of men, um, that there's a problem because the, a lot of men don't want to acknowledge that there's a problem, and then how do you fix something that has not been acknowledged? Um, I think I think that's a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I really would like you to unpack this whole concept of you know patriarchy, manhood. Um, masculinity because when you look at this struggle of men just refusing to acknowledge the problem and not not even prepared to meet women halfway, you know, to say the world has changed it's no longer 1850 you also providing um how how is it fair that men are allowed to dream and achieve their highest ambitions because of the support that they have from the women because without that support they wouldn't have been able to get to the top of the chain for the food chain or or whatever you call it um and they don't feel any guilt about that. Whereas women are feeling guilty about being poor mothers and poor wives, uh, thinking that they have the responsibility to carry this burden for, for society. And, and how this so whole notion of masculinity has an impact on society generally. Because at the end of the day, if we're not using the resources of the country efficiently and effect effectively because in my marriage for instance we were not using the resources effectively mm. because if i i didn't have the burden of um those domestic responsibilities i would have achieved more mm. not just for myself but for our, for our family yes. and if my husband was willing to, to to contribute towards assisting me with other things we could have used those resources effectively. So this whole system is inefficient in itself, uh, which is why when the man doesn't feel like they are the breadwinner in the family, they feel like they are failures. 
But if, if your wife is, is a better provider, why don't we just use, you know, those resources more efficiently? Yes. So just unpack this for us, because I think maybe this understanding will, it will explain to us why men are really just not willing to move the dial. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's a very, very profound uh, question. And also, uh, I know I, I, there are important reflections in there. Uh, the first thing that I'm I'm thinking of here is how the challenge also goes to the not the yeah the commodification of um, provision right that the idea is that if a man goes out to work and the woman is taking care of the family that the the care work is not labor or that it's not according to capitalist standards patriarchal standards it's not something to be remunerated for. So then in an ideal society, um, you would have a situation where women get paid and acknowledged for the work that they do in the household if they so choose to, because it is actually a form of labor that really goes acknowledged and is very much difficult than uh, someone waking up and and going to work. So I, I think the challenge comes in the way that the contestations on um, putting a sort of a figure or a, a currency rather to the fact that I wake up and I go to work, then that's worth m- much than what you are bringing to the table. Um, I think in an ideal society, if I mean a lot of feminists have suggested this, um, this idea of saying that uh, this is actually unpaid labor that, that, is, that we're letting go by and no one is ready to address that, which is the elephant in the room. Um, but to, again, to talk to that question around why men are not willing to sort of move and, and, and communicate and talk about this, uh, we don't realize how much patriarchy as a system also oppresses men. Uh, not that they are victims, but how much pressure in that s- story that you share, that the pressure is there to say, the moment uh, my wife earns more than me, that's a challenge, right? Like, it's it becomes... Um, a challenge and a competition. Uh, so then, what does this do to to this man who is basically creating a war where there is none, right? So it's it's an, a form of const- constructed um, battle that does not necessarily exist. Um, but to 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 also t- uh, bring in another point here, uh, Mamnonku, that in this particular um, debacle that that takes place is is very unfortunate that. There's a lot of violence and anger that is very, very much connected to it. That the failure to deliver uh, for my family, the failure to provide some sort of retrenchment, even disability, has led to a lot of um, violence because as a man you become angry that I can't meet certain goals. You, you put pressure on yourself, but also society is telling you that this, there's this written and unwritten template that says, you are supposed to be the provider. So in that way, then you become you become um, you become very problematic and, and and violent. Then women become objects, unfortunately, in in in, in spoils of war in, in all of this. Uh, and to expand it, when we talk about uh, as a foreigner myself, xenophobic attacks. Um, that would you actually believe that one of the contestations for around xenophobic attacks is the foreigners are taking South African women, which basically means. There's somewhere, somewhere where it's a myth somewhere that the women are objects and spoils for war. That what we are defending is these um, women of ours from these men who actually had ever said that they needed protecting uh, is something that um, that we, we we can talk about. But patriarchy then invents all of these um, all of these myths that cause curios- curiosities and and a lot of uh, mental health issues that uh, if we were to go down to it, uh, a lot of mental health that in, in the rise in suicide um, uh, cases amongst men comes from, from how this really um, informs um, uh, how, how this really informs what it means for me to perform my masculinity. Um, on a global level, we, we can talk about local and global wars, we talk about turf wars, we talk about violence in the name of egos, right? Um, that's the male ego must not be bruised. 
Um, so meaning, in other words, my ideas should not be challenged, um, which is an invention and, and really an, an unrealistic way uh, in building a democratic society. Like you said, how much do we lose from having such a character? In building a de democratic society, you have in that male ego really inefficient leadership because if someone cannot listen to the ideas and opinions of others in the house, in, in, at home, then they won't even be willing to listen to the ideas of people in parliament um, or even to listen to the ideas of ma other male counterparts who might have lesser resources so, uh, than them. So whenever one enters a space, there's that idea that I need to be seen and to be felt to be the person who is in charge and, and, in, and, and controlling here. So, so then th that whole system, uh, Mam Nongku, uh, really objectifies and leads to the death, actually, the, 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 the death of women uh, through femicide, but also amongst men themselves, the, the gun violence, like you hear someone was killed over, like, who you spilled my beer in a tavern. Then you ask yourself, really, was this really about what was at stake, or it was just a, a question of egos? Sure. Yeah, you are, you are really bringing another really big element here. Uh, which answers this question actually of um, why we, we men are just so stubborn around giving up this power that they've enjoyed for for such a long time. Because I think it also explains why women who are working and are now helping in prov providing for the family, that is not recognized, mm. right? Mm. They are not being respected because they are now providers, right? They are still seen in the same stereotype of um, the woman who is weak and inferior. Mm. So their work as caregivers uh, was not recognized when they were doing solely that. And now, even when they are working, mm. that that contribution to the family is not recognized. Mm. And uh, it, it brings me to, to this question of women, even in the workplace, right? Mm. They come into these masculine environments and they are expected to fit into the stereotype of, of a woman as the, you know, the caregiver, the nature, mm. the so on which is, you know, not, again, not important, because what is important is the masculine energy that, that is the one that drives, that is aggressive, that achieves by dominance and, and all of that. And, and so, no matter how good the woman is, even at work, yeah. that is not recognized, mm -hmm. you know, because, again, we're dealing with egos. If... I acknowledge that the the woman is just as powerful as me and as smart as me, then somehow my own value then diminishes as a man. Mm. So I must stubbornly deny this woman and, and actually try to work them out of the system because they've become such a threat. Now that we explain it to my ego, really, mm. We don't care about the environment. We don't care about this business or this organization. Yeah. It's all about preserving this male ego. And it is amazing how, as women, we've also assisted in this. Because when you talk about dress codes, for instance, yeah. we've always considered men. You know, we can't dress this way mm. because it's going to provoke men, and, and, and because we dress this way, they are entitled to attack us mm. or, or rape us. And men can dress anyhow, yeah. you know, and, um, and it's okay. So we've also, I suppose for, for our safety and security, mm. we've sort of assisted this whole system to actually thrive and, and, and survive. Mm. But then... If, if, if then the, the issue is ego, and if, I mean, as you are explaining here, it, it's turning into violence, these, these bruised egos of men, of these powerful, smart women mm -hmm. who may 
with the sole provider, the, the men, in most cases of this, this violent, uh, domestic violence, they are not working. It's mm. the woman who's actually bringing uh, the bread in, into the family. So in spite of the fact that this now has become a serious problem in society, this, are you saying that these egos are so stubborn that we are blind to, to the reality of the situation? As no, there's no sense of it is now time mm -hmm. to all open our hearts to the problem so that we can at least solve the, the societal problem. Yeah. What do you think is, is behind this stubbornness? in spite of the glaring problem that we all see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that there are communities and groups and organizations that are doing work with men, uh, like trying to conscientize uh, and socialize and have conversations with men about um, the, the importance of shifting perspective attitudes uh, and, and, and desisting from... Um, uh, from from violence uh, as a way of as a mechanism of expressing frustration, um, those exist, um, but in an informal kind of way. We we talk about socialization and we talk about social pressure as some of the reasons why systems are held together. Right, uh, the idea that when you go out for a drink, for example, the kind of crowd that you hang out with, what kind of conversations are you having? Right, and so you 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 sit in a space where someone says. Uh, like it's a way to express that you, you know she won't she won't uh, disrespect me um, and sadly there, there's still groups of uh, a lot of men that still believe that that's a way to discipline a, a, a woman right as if th there is any need to discipline um, so, so then the same way that uh, a, a child is disciplined uh, quote unquote then the woman also then then the woman is like a child to, to these men um, so it is said that in, within these socializing spaces, it's reinforced the question of male uh, male integrity uh, to say when you gather, there's there's an invisible need, uh, an in, uh, unwritten law rather code that you have to be the most financially capable in order for you to be respected. So then there's that um, thing that feeds into that. Um, and one of the other things that I wanted to speak to is that. Um, the construction of manhood uh, is is really classed, right? And that's why it's, it's it's very much unachievable. And we now have a problem in South Africa of, um, well, I don't know if calling it a problem uh, is okay, but I I think it's part of the 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 consequences of these pressures, like this um, outdoor partying uh, bottle culture where you have black men buying expensive bottles and dressing, you know, um, it's called conspicuous, conspicuous consumption, uh, the way I dress in expensive clothing is how I'm validated as a man. So that then manhood is also now attached to a lot of products. Uh, so, so then consumerism feeds into that. But then what happens to those who then go to, into these spaces and you're seeing other men doing that, then you say that is the definition of what it means to be, let, let's say, a man or to be a father. Um, then you sort of aspire towards the unachievable because you basically, uh, like what my my a parent would always say, like my mom would always say, you don't know how people make their monies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then you, you, are, you are pushing yourself towards something that you might not necessarily achieve. Uh, so then it comes with that then identity and social and social uh, socialization to say, to which values do you attach your your manhood to? I, I think, but also to go to a very critical question as someone who works with queer theory, which which basically problematizes the the normalization of uh, straight straightness as a sexuality, or even uh, the the idea that manhood is an essence that you can say this is manhood and these are the characteristics I've touched it, and and you find that the 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 the, fall the, the uh, sort of fallacy of manhood is exposed when you see that um, men from South Africa are not like men from Zimbabwe or Tunisia or Cameroon. Like people have people are different in all shapes, sizes, feelings, and and actually uh, women, I, would, I, I think, when it comes to characteristics of manhood, are actually men, men than 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 men themselves because. 
uh, if men are really strong, well, they haven't been given the opportunity <laughs> to go on the test of giving birth, of childbirth. Exactly. But, you know, but then it shows that what we attach strength to uh, is political, that if uh, the myth is that men can carry heavier weights than women, then, but what, why do we value that to uh, what women's capacities? Um, uh, the idea that men are, n- uh, men are not emotional. Well, I've seen a thousand men cry, right? So, so then every myth can be demystified. So you find here a man trying to live up to social expectations and codes that are really not true. That uh, even the ideal standard kind of men that you would want to put up there cannot pass the manhood test. Um, uh, let's let me just give one sort of very sort of dark, sad example. Um, in in Nazi Germany, when Adolf Hitler was perpetuating the idea that um, the the German race and, and sort of the masculinity attached with his identity was sort of the the best form of humanity and of manhood rather. Um, but what happens when he gets captured in his bunker? Um, he dies in a sort of not not so manly way, which is I mean suicide, right? Like he then ends himself. Is that not sort of in that context a cowardly way to go for someone who says we are the epitome of all races, manhood, and being? So all of these are really, really, um, pardon my French, but stupid and ridiculous um, ways uh, and constructions that put people under pressure. Uh, but th- the sad part is beyond pressure they objectify and dominate and kill. I mean, it's so sad that we we are held and bound by myths, Mm. right? So what you've just defined then is that manhood itself, masculinity itself, patriarchy itself, um, whatever we consider as womanhood itself, are all just myths. But unfortunately, these myths have been perpetuated by society and as societies were so conditioned to believe these myths about ourselves that were unable to break free, which is why it, it, it awakened our focus is really to say we cannot wait for men to change. Let's look at ourselves as women and set ourselves free because we're also, you know, we may think of, of ourselves as victims of this system, mm. but we've enabled it by also believing and, and agreeing to participate in the system. And, and, and the way to start, because when I look at men, you've explained now that really what we're dealing with is this male ego. I mean, who's ever going to deal with the male ego except the man himself? Mm. And so the women need to start that journey of freeing themselves from this conditioning uh, that society has socialized them uh, into so that we can find our own freedom as women. And I suppose, who knows, that as we find that freedom, men will also feel the need now to also free themselves from, from this bondage. Because, I mean, what we've just described is... Pure bondage. Yeah. As we close, we've run out of time. <laughs> Is there just one uh, something important that we've not touched today that you believe we, uh, should be shared with uh, with my audience? Well, I think my, my last words would be around the work that you're doing to say I really, really commend you for the work. And I think it's very important work. Uh, the mind is, is, is a very important site for, for domination. And also, w- when you were talking about... Um, the um, the idea of not waiting for men, which I think is actually um, very very strategic and needed, because to be honest, uh, when uh, the struggle for con- col- uh, for against colonialism was taking place, the the fighter, the resistor, the guerrilla was not willing to wait for the white men to change. Um, the 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 oppressor had to see it in them in themselves that the conditions no longer allow uh, s- such form of backward thinking, right? So, so I think, um, easy as it is to say, I think it's a very powerful and revolutionary statement to say that 
um, as we wait, uh, it might not necessarily change, like in, in which won't actually change in, in, in a moment or in, in the flash of a, um, an eye. But then at the end of the day, um, women um, need to do the work and uh, really con continue to, to, to think about the work that has gone into the programming uh, of the patriarchal beliefs and uh, systems within the, their very minds and lives. So I very much commend you for that work, and yeah, uh, let's let's keep the conversations going. Thank you so much, Kazai, for this powerful conversation. As we always say at Awakened, you've got to focus on finding your true self so that you can begin to function from your authentic power. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Mm -hmm.